Welcome to Beer and Business. This week we are with Kyle Noonan, and he is the founder of Free Range Concepts, which is a restaurant development company. But why don't you tell me what Free Range is in your own words? I know what it says yeah. in words, but the passions behind it, you can describe it so much better than I can. Sure. Well, we're, we're, we're at the end of the day a hospitality company that's really operating in the industri industry of entertainment. We like the idea of, of the entertainment world because we think that that's something that's going to be tough to to replace this idea of coming together and having an experience. But we approach it from a restaurateur standpoint where we bring in good food, good service, and then we also have this entertainment component to, to everything that we do. Our, our brands are really cool. We, we have four different brands currently, all very different. The Rustic, which is a, a restaurant and bar with a concert venue. Um, and that's very important, the, the way we say it that way, that it's a restaurant and bar with a concert venue, not a concert venue that serves food. Because again, that helps define who we are and that determines our approach to putting the emphasis and the effort into the food, the service, the hospitality. And then, yeah, by the way, we can, we can have 2,500 people for a concert. Or the same approach we take with Bowling Barrel, our bowling alley. We have three of those locations throughout Texas. And they're very high-end bowling alleys, but they're, but they're really, at, at its core, a restaurant and bar that has some bowling lanes as opposed to a bowling alley that serves bad food and you know and a, we've all been, been in there <laughs> bowling alleys with the sticky floors and the bad nacho cheese and uh, stale beer so you know again what's defined us is we took something that was an uh, it was actually in the entertainment world and in, in this idea of going bowling but we we took it from a, an approach of a restaurant tour and and added an element of hospitality and care to what we were doing and that was really just set us apart in the marketplace because nobody else is doing it. Then we have our, 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 our concept Mutt's, which I love. Mutt's Canine Cantina, which is a dog park restaurant. Right bar. next door. It's right next door. We're going to be growing that pretty rapidly over the next couple of years. Um, and it's a membership driven dog park where we take care of your dog. You come let your dog run around. We clean up after the dog and play with the dog. Well, you get to enjoy a nice cold beer. Um, or a good burger out, out and underneath an oak tree while your four-legged friend is having a good time. So that's a really unique concept. It's kind of innovative, but it's really based in simple, simple, a simple idea that people like to go out and hang out with their dog and you might as well give them food and drink while But they, they, do they get to take a little break on, in the process. They do, they that's do, a, they do. And then the general public. And then the general public's our last concept. We realized with our bowling barrel concept that we had a crummy bar next to our original bowling barrel that we didn't own and operate. And they were busy all the time and I couldn't figure out why. And so I went in and I talked to the owner one day and he said, he said honestly, we're busy because, uh, because you guys are here and, and we, we, we get 60 to 70% of our business from spillover from, from, what your, from what your concept's bringing in to the neighborhood. And that was my aha moment that I said, you know what, instead of just feeding our neighbor, we might as well be our neighbor. Uh, that is really just a spillover place for Bowling Barrel because Bowling Barrel is such a high demand concept where we might go on a two, three hour wait at night. Um, and so people can come in, get their name on the list for a bowling lane, go next door, have a great meal, have some fun, maybe listen to some live music, have some great cocktails, and then come back and, and, and finish up and bowl. So what is Free Range Concept? I don't know. We're, we're a restaurant company operating in the entertainment space or we're an entertainment company being run by restaurant tours. I don't know. We've been called both, but uh, either way, I think, it, I think it's worked so far. Now you also support Texas craft beer. So yeah, what, do just, you, what do you have there? I just snuck a drink of it. It was good. These are two of the 40 Texas brews that we have on tap. Two of the 40. What do two you have the there? So I have the Petty Colas Velvet Hammer coming right out of Dallas, Texas. And I've got Revolver Blood and Honey that I know for fact comes out of Austin, but it's right. all Texas Cheers. beer and it's all cold and, and good. it's cold and good. You know, Tom, this is one of the reasons why we love our business and why we believe in our business, because getting to just break bread with, with somebody else, drink a cold beer, um, you know, eat, drink, whatever it might be with other people. That's one of the few things that I think is irreplaceable right now by technology. Um, technology is going to affect and has affected a lot of industries and, and it does affect the food service industry to a certain degree, but it doesn't, it, I don't see it eradicating the industry for a long time because this, this experience that we're having here is you, you just can't do it through your iPhone or, or on your laptop. Um, so that's why we love this industry. 
And it's, it's a really great industry. And you know, what's curious to entrepreneurs all around the world that like, like to watch and, and learn from what we do on Valuetainment, one of the big questions people always say is, when did you get the entrepreneurial bug and when did you go do it? And your background is interesting because you're in school studying nothing close to business. Right, right, right. Yeah, I was an art major. I was a painting and sculpting major. Uh, but I realized very quickly when it came time to taking girls out on dates um, that I needed money. And I had, to, I had to figure out a way to make money. And being a starving artist is really attractive and romantic in, in a movie but in real life it's just not. Um, and so I had to go out and get a job. And I, the, the, the job I went out and got was waiting tables. I know you've had another guest, Rogers Healy. He and I started waiting tables at the same restaurant, Papado's Seafood Kitchen. Seriously? And I, uh, <laughs> and this is a true story, I, I started about a year before him and I moved into management pretty quickly. And so he uh, and he and I have been friends, you know, for years now. And he he often jokes that I I'm his first boss um, because he started as a waiter when I was a new manager. And so yeah, Papado Seafood Kitchen here in Dallas is where we both kind of got our start, um, and we learned a lot of skills in the in the industry. And I ended up falling in love with it and never left. But then you went you got a very very practical and a very good apprenticeship, joining a professional restaurant expansion company, development right. company, right? Right. Tell a little bit about that first, but then second is what led you to be flying on this nice career, comfortable seats and everything, you had a good career, good thing going, but you said, you know what? And you opened the door and you put on a parachute and you jumped out to do it sure. yourself. So how did you, tell us about the career yeah. onto that point, and then what led you to get out of the seat, put on a parachute and jump? Really, at the end of the day, I, I am grateful that I got to cut my teeth with such a, a great company, um, a company that's really well-renowned and well high, high, held in high regard uh, for the operations that they, that they really consistently execute and have done so for now three decades, um, which is pretty rare in this industry to have that longevity. You know, I learned a lot with the, with the company and, and this is one of the things that I like to teach young entrepreneurs now is we talk, we talk a lot about motivation, you know, motiv whether you're watching motivation videos or reading self-help books or whatever it might be, motivation is a great thing and it's a useful thing and it's an important thing, but you got to have the education. And, and, and I don't mean necessarily through, through school, you know, just you have to be a practitioner of your industry and you have to know your industry and you have to put in the time and the energy and the effort because motivation only gets you so far, right? If you're an idiot and you motivate, if you, if you take an idiot and you motivate the idiot, all you, you have get, a motivated you have idiot. A motivated, motivated idiot, and that's no good. So you have to, you know, you have to have um, the education, which I was so thankful that I got for 13 years with that organization. You know, the motivation came from dinner, actually. Uh, the two brothers, Harris and Chris Pappas, who own Pappas Brothers Company, took me down, took me to dinner. Um, I was I was running operations for them in Chicago at the time, and I was a I was a young man. I still am a young man, but I was uh, in my early 30s, and and. The two Pappas brothers uh, said, Kyle, look, we, we know that you're a, a motivated, driven, hungry person, yep. and we know you have a lot of ambition, and we want you to know that we love you, and you're an you're a extreme asset to this company, but we care about you as a person, and we, and we, we, we want to make sure that you understand that your last name isn't Pappas, so you're never going to own the company. You're always going to have a place here but you're always gonna be an employee and never gonna own it. That was a hard thing to hear. It was not surprising necessarily, but it, sure. it, it was a wake up call and it, and, it, and it made me go, wow, how much respect do I have for them to tell me that? But also, now I need to start thinking what's important. Do I wanna be an employee and sign the back of the checks or do I wanna sign the front of the checks and be an employer and what, what really motivates me? And I was able to answer that question for myself pretty quickly and, and, and that was I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to write the check, <laughs> sign the checks on the front and be the boss. Yeah, what's so interesting about that is you would think a person in that position would say, well then I'm gonna go out and open this little restaurant here. But instead, you built free range concepts that clearly had a vision beyond one restaurant. It did. I mean, we well, we opened four units, and this is where sometimes you have to be a little 
uh, reckless maybe in, in, in business and, and almost have just no fear, be bold. Um, I love that. We, most people would think that opening a 15,000 square foot, really high end bowling alley in, in itself is extremely ambitious for your first go. You know, a multi-million dollar project. We did four of them in 11 months and we also started a television show during that time. And it was just my partner and I, my best friend from college. Uh, he and I were college roommates and we're still best friends today. Hey, tell me if this is correct. I, I read that you went from like two to 600 employees in like 18 months, 17 we, months? We did, we did. We didn't go from two employees. It was, it was my partner and I in my home office. And that's, we still have a picture of him and I in my home office. Um, and it's now been only five and a half years ago that this happened. Uh, or that this picture was taken, that he and I were starting the company in my office and typing manuals and, and documents and things like that. Less than, less than two years later, we looked up and we had, we had well over 500 employees um, and, uh, and several units throughout Texas. So you started scaling and a lot of entrepreneurs will get something going and a lot of entrepreneurs will you know, get nothing going. But when you get something going, you can be the dog that caught the taxi. So how did you scale it and what was critical or who did you have to hire to join your partner and you so that going from two to 600 uh, employees was structured and it scaled nicely, it didn't turn into a circus? Well, it's still kind of a circus. In any startup, there's, there's chaos behind the scenes. And, and a lot of times, you know, we, we probably could all imagine this, this theater production going on stage that all looks finely tuned and perfect, but backstage it's just, it's catastrophe and disaster and people are running around like crazy. You just described um, the Academy Awards. Yeah, exactly. And then they announced yeah. the wrong best picture <laughs> yeah, a year yeah, ago. Yeah. So. so mistakes happen too to the, to, to the outward public. But you know, one of the most important things that we believe in and that we pride ourselves in, and I say we, I mean our, our, our entire team, not just my partner and I, is, is the entrepreneurial spirit. People that join our, our, our organization, um, whether it's a C-level person or an entry-level person, they all share the, the entrepreneurial spirit and, the, and they get excited about the fact that we're building something. Fortunately, we've bred a culture of and continue to attract entrepreneurs that um, really take ownership and, and, and pride in, crea in the creation um, and the building of something. You know, I, I, one, of, one of my good friends who owns a well-known uh, publication, we were talking about living in a city, but he, he said he read, he read that the only thing that is better than living in a great city is helping to build a great city. And that quote always stuck with me, and I, and I, I think that that's right. I think that's accurate, at least for me. And, and anybody with an entrepreneurial spirit likes the building of something. Um, and so our team is filled with a lot of builders and a lot of creators, which has led to our success. Were you intentional about your culture? Or did your culture happen and you say, you know, I love what we've established this year. Let's keep yeah. what we've, let's keep what grew. Or did you say, no, we're gonna be about these things. And if we do it right, the culture will honestly mean those things. I think it's both. We were intentional early on and we had some core principles that we knew we wanted to operate by, but our culture has evolved over, over the course of the last five years. And it's evolved in part because we're smarter now and we know what's more important, you know? But also because the team that has, that has come together has helped mold that culture. Um, I'll give you an example, our mission statement when we first started out. When we wrote our mission statement, it was, it was, it was brilliant. It was a literary masterpiece. We, we were so proud of it and it was filled with a bunch of you know, words like, like strategy and competition and <laughs> superior and things like this. And, you know, there, but there was one problem, nobody, nobody could recite it. And I would, walk, I would walk into our stores and nobody had any idea what our mission statement was. And over the course of the next six months, my partner and I just said, you know what, we gotta, we gotta make this mission statement count to where it, it actually means something and it is all of our mission. And so we boiled it down, boiled it down. We went from you know, a paragraph to two sentences to one long sentence to, you know, and we kept going and we kept going until we finally got to what is currently our mission statement. And, and it's something that we all talk about every day. And, and our mission is very simple. It's to create remarkable memories. Um, it's not more complicated than that. It's everybody's job to get together and challenge each other. How did you create a remarkable memory today? 
Um, and we talk about it all the time. We talk about the importance of those words, why we chose the word remarkable, because remarkable is defined as worth making a remark about. So we wanted to not only create a good memory for somebody, but a memory that they would go out and then talk about. We also, uh, in our second to last iteration of, of the mission statement, it was to create remarkable memories for our guests. We didn't stop there, we ended up taking out for our guests and just shortened it to create remarkable memories because we knew that it was just as important to create remarkable memories for, for each other, uh, for one another, for those in our community, for our vendors, anybody that came into contact with us, we wanted them to remember us and remember that experience and that memory and be able to go talk about it. What's interesting is people like to make remarks about successes, but it's also very valid and very um, self-introspective and educational to make remarks about failures, but do so in the right way. So two questions. First is, what is like a failure or mistake that you made early on that didn't go so well and how did you recover from it? And then how do you handle failures or mistakes with your people so that you have this thriving business where people strive not to make them, but they're not afraid to tell you what happened? Because the worst thing is big mistakes question. happen yeah. and you don't know. Yeah, no, that's a great question. That's something that we, we do talk often about, creating an environment where if you're giving your best and you mess up, it's okay. You know, but I'll tell you, in the industry we live in, and the world we live in, and the industry we operate in, our mistakes are pretty evident pretty quick because it's a common phrase everybody's a critic. Well, in this industry, and, and I think more apt, everybody's a food critic. And with the advent of Yelp and Open Table, Open Table Google reviews, Facebook, our consumers talk to us pretty pretty readily and pretty uh, ruthlessly. On the way home. Yeah, on the way home. So we know if we're, if we're making mistakes. Um, and I can tell you that as an entrepreneur, that's probably one of the things that, maybe not necessarily that, that it was a mistake that we made early on, but it was how we interpreted um, the feedback from our guests. You know, we would get defensive about it. Well, they just didn't understand that this is, you know, they don't understand what we did, you know, what we were really trying to, oh, that guy's, that guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know what? It doesn't matter. He, he has this feeling. He came in, had an experience, and didn't like it for one reason or another. And left $85 on date night. Yeah, exactly. So it, it really doesn't matter what, what excuse you have or what reason or how you try and justify the consumer's perception of you, their, their perception is there is the reality and it's the only reality that matters. And so you've got to figure out as a young company and really as an old company, how do you respond to market feedback? And um, I think that we've had to learn that over time and understand the importance of, of really taking every bit of feedback, every bit of information to heart and figuring out how we can be better on the next, on the next go round. If you ever have a chance in Las Vegas to go to Zappos and take yeah. the tour, it's just over the top what you see. But what you see is there are certain traits in every employee, from finance to design to everything, there are certain traits that are there. Uh, and they're like Zappos traits. This isn't like the Stepford Wives. It's right. they're just the traits of what makes Zappos great. They're really careful about who they hire. What are some of the traits you look for? And a minute ago, you mentioned a couple of principles. So what are your principles? And then what are the traits you look for in people so that you know those principles are gonna be upheld? I like to boil it down. I don't, I don't like to overcomplicate things and make have a long list of things that are important. So we've really boiled it down to two things. One, are you an entrepreneur? And do you have that mindset, that makeup, that, that, that wiring that is required? to say, you know what, I'm not worried about what my job is or what their job is. We're just gonna get it done one way or another. We. And, and we are, gonna, we are gonna, uh, gonna accomplish the task. That's the first thing. And then the second thing, and this is probably the most important thing, we're in the hospitality business. And in this business, th there, there has to be a sense of wanting to take care of people. If you don't have that desire, that, that, that outward look on people, and that mindset of if you want to get what you want in life, you gotta help enough people get what they want in life. If you don't have that wiring that I just wanna take care of people, then you're not gonna make it very far with us because we have that, that culture and 
those are really the two things that we look at. Everything else can be figured out. I don't care what your, what your background is, what your education level is, what your experience level is. If you have those two things, you, you, can, you can thrive in our organization. You said you hire people with an entrepreneur mindset. What are one or two maybe traits that you, that you see in people and you say, okay, you've got it. I, I, you can be here as long as you want if you keep that mindset. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think I, I shy away from uh, people that have titles and that, 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 that take too much pride and this is where I work, this is my degree, this is my background, this was my title at my last job because that really doesn't matter if, uh, uh, you know, if you start initially talking about those types of things then then I'm I lose interest pretty fast so I think that's one of the first things but but ultimately there's a hunger that that entrepreneurs have there's this mindset that I'm gonna go get it done whatever way by whatever means and it doesn't matter what's going on in the world it doesn't I'm not gonna sit there and make a list of excuses as to why something isn't gonna work I'm gonna go figure out how to make it work and you can find that in a person that hunger, that passion, pretty quickly. Within, within 30 seconds of meeting them, you're, you, you can find out if they're excited, enthusiastic about what they do, or if they're more about who they are and where they're from and what their title is, and who, or who their dad was, or whatever the case may be. It really comes down to, can you feel that passion? And, and um, that's what we look for. As I had one entrepreneur say, he says, Tom, have you ever leaned back in a chair and almost fallen? Yeah, I once felt that way for four months straight. Yeah. I'm like, you know what? That's perfect. There's no other description that can describe that. That, that am I going to make it? Am I not going to make it? What is something you say? Hey, when you feel this, you know you're going to be okay. But push through it because this is what you're going to feel on the other side. Yeah, entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs that are successful anyway, always feel like that. Like things are going to crumble at any given moment, right? It's kind of you're walking that edge. Um, it doesn't matter how successful you are. You you, you just have that inner drive that. Uh oh, things are about to happen, and, and and if I don't fix it, then we're all gonna we're all gonna perish, right? And I think that that's part of the drive that keeps successful people motivated and and not getting fat and not getting happy. And you know, I'm, I talk a lot about how I'm a, generally in life I'm a very positive person, but in business I'm 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 kind of glass half empty, and I'm always looking at okay, I don't care about the win yesterday. I care about the challenge tomorrow and how we're gonna how we're gonna get better, right? So I think that's the first thing. But the second thing, it, probably more than anything, uh, with entrepreneurship, um, and I learned this from my parents. Uh, my parents were uh, hardworking. I came from a good household. Uh, they they didn't start with much, but they they created quite a bit in their lifetime. But what was interesting is when they really started to thrive is during the financially and professionally is during the same time that my sister who's eight years younger than me was diagnosed with leukemia and given a 10 percent chance to live and my parents were, were had every excuse not to do well in life with that you know uh, but mindset is a binary decision and it's either I'm gonna be a, a I'm gonna take a positive approach or I'm gonna take a neg negative approach to, to how I approach things I'm either gonna be a winner or I'm gonna be a loser and I learned that from my parents. Um, I'm, I'm grateful because I saw them. They, they said, you know what? We're gonna beat cancer, which they did. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna still thrive professionally, which they did. Um, and they had, a, they had that winner mindset. That's something that I think is probably one of the key ingredients to our success. It's just about how you attack the, uh, attack the day and attack life that defines your success or, or your losses. If you can't take something from that and put it into your business and your life, you don't have a pulse. You know, I think that was that was brilliant, and um, I'm glad to hear that your sister is a survivor. Yeah, uh, my little sister is a breast cancer survivor. So yeah, what a coming minute. coming up on 20 years. Cheers to that. To all the survivors yeah. and the people that supported them. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really really appreciated this. If you had to give, you know, two management parting shots real quick about how you're managing now as you've, you have made it. So Free Range has got several restaurants out there. They're thriving. They've done. And now you're at this level now. You've gone from organizing and originating. Now you're really operating. Mm -hmm. But you're staying with this entrepreneurial mindset. How do you manage your people to keep an entrepreneurial mindset when a lot of them might feel just like it's, well, we're just kind of operating day in, day out? 
Sure. Um, I, I can tell you that I, I, re I really, and my team knows this, I'm a what if guy and I'm a let's go guy. And, and those are two different things and I'll get to both of them. When we're in meetings or when we're walking through a restaurant or when we're out in another restaurant, at a competitor's restaurant or wherever it might be, when I start to say what if, my team goes, okay, this is gonna be a while because we're gonna sit here and round table <laughs> things for a long time because Kyle's gonna go, well, what if we did it this way? Or what if the world was like this? Or what if we created this environment? Or what if, right? And so thinking in those, in, in those terms of what if, I get really turned off by people that you ask them why they do something Something, and they go, I don't know, it's just because that's the way it's always been done. And it, just because it's always been done that way might, might be okay, but at least know why it's been done that way. Don't just do it because that's the way it's been done. Understand why you do it that way. And if it's not the best way, then figure out a better way. So that's the first thing is what if guy, because that, 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 that sparks a lot of conversations. What if it was like this? Or what if we did it this way? And then the second thing is the let's go guy. Um, it, it, it's always a let's go do this. Let's go make it happen. It's not I'm gonna go make it happen. It's let's go make it happen. And, and having that one call to action, but to the mindset of we're gonna do it all together is very important. And we always have that, that, that mindset here internally at Free Range Concepts of let's go do this together. Let's go accomplish it together. Because not only are you gonna your chances of success are increased exponentially if you're doing it as a group, but you're also going to enjoy it a lot more in the process because you get to celebrate the, the, the process and the win with the people that help you climb that mountain. Fantastic. Love it. I, well, we really appreciate the privilege of being able to be here with you. I sincerely say that. The privilege and, is mine. Uh, the, I promise. Entrepreneurs all around the world are going to understand a lot of things, whether they're operating a t-shirt company in Berlin, Germany, or it's a housing contractor in Omaha, Nebraska. There are entrepreneurs out there that are looking for these kernels of wisdom and encouragement. Where you are today and where you were yesterday is, is, is so different. And um, as we close, what piece of advice would today's Kyle wish you could have given day one Kyle? I would say just be thankful for the people that hang out or that help you and, and uh, don't take anything for granted because really most of the world doesn't care about you and the few people that do, uh, you, gotta, you gotta hold on to them and be grateful for them and not take them for granted. It all comes down to people. Yeah. Thank you so much. So much appreciated. This is wonderful. To be here. Come see us next week on a beer in business. This week again, it was Kyle Noon here at Free Range Concepts, creator of the Rustic. And if you're in Dallas, come check out the Rustic. You will not be disappointed. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth, and I hope we left you better than we found you.